Hey guys, it is finally here. My interview with my audio engineer, Lenny B, where we talk about the basics of audio engineering, soundproofing your space, the equipment that you're using, troubleshooting issues whenever you're first getting started in voiceover. And he has been gracious enough to give you guys two coupon codes for his courses, EQ Fundamentals for Voice and voiceover production concepts for beginners. You guys get 15% off each of those courses up through September of this year, 2021, when you use coupon code NM15. That's coupon code NM15. Without further ado, enjoy the interview. So for people who are just getting started and they're putting together their home studios, um, in terms of square one, what are the suggestions that you would make if they're looking at their house and trying to find a spot of where to set up? Yeah, uh, it's important to, when you're looking, let, let's establish kind of a goal too. And I think what you, um, to get the best sound or to get the job that you're going for or to try to, you know, get that audition is really what we're looking for, right? When you're putting a studio, a home studio together for voiceover. Yes. That's correct, yeah. Um, you know, there's there's really the best sound that you can get in your studio to begin with, it all starts in the room and then processing and recording and all the stuff afterwards is really designed to optimize. Um, so it's really important. And there's three types of noise you should really uh, understand and know, know to uh, look out for. There's external noise, which is the cars outside and it's the sirens and the dog barks and the kids playing. There's the internal noise in your room, which could be a computer fan which could be, um, uh, you know, any anything that's something that falls or just, you know, the air conditioner vent or the uh, the heater or whatever, that, that, that'll be picked up. And then there's the reflections. And the reflections are the biggest issue. Um, the microphone is very powerful and it picks up a lot of even quiet stuff. And it doesn't become perceptible, perceivable, perceptible. I'm not sure. It doesn't, cool. you don't really understand it and notice it until you add compression and do the processing down the chain. So getting it really, get eliminating those reflections is probably the biggest thing. So, um, you know, when you're looking for a space, you kind of have to understand all those and, you know, away from the external noise, maybe a place inside the center of the building in your house. Um, closets are a huge thing for, you know, beginning voiceover. And I love them. I think that's a great idea. But those reflections, and we can talk more about that. When you're, when you speak, your voice is bouncing all over the place. And, um, you know, if it's a symmetrical room, perfectly square, the reflections are going to be more apparent than if it's not, or if uh, a higher ceiling or, you know what I mean? So you got to kind of think about those things. And I think the first time we spoke, we talked about closing your eyes and like imagining the um, size of the room. It's like when you talk in an empty room, you can kind of imagine the size of the room. That's your brain listening to only those reflections. And um, that's what you have to eliminate. That's what we want to kill. Right. So if someone's in their house and they're choosing between kind of a rectangular shaped closet versus a more square area, they're probably, you would probably suggest going for a more rectangle shape where they can kind of control that. Or if they go more towards you know, I'm in a square in my closet. So I quickly learned that I have to cover almost every surface in here mm -hmm. because I had no idea what, you know, how to understand the sound reflections or even what they were when I was setting up this particular space. Sure. Uh, if it's a, if it's a perfect square, like we're really, you and I are going to work further on this um, in your room. If it's a perfect square, you could just put something and hang something that will offset that. I mean, you do have the base traps on the rounded uh, things at the end, uh, at the corners of your studio, but you can upset, you can upset a perfectly square room. So, so it doesn't bounce because it, it, it causes resonance, which is um, a particular one particular frequency range is louder than all the others. And it's just an acoustic thing, but um, yeah, I don't, I, we don't want to get too deep about it, but the more you can, the less you could make it perfectly square or, you know, even everywhere. And you can do that with stuff, which any, you know, stuff that you have around the house, which costs nothing, which is good. Right. And just that, you know, that's such a simple rule to kind of keep in mind. And when I was looking around to set up my first studio, I was finding a lot of pictures of these large rooms with the base traps and where to put everything and how to organize it. But 
I didn't find quite as many for much more scaled down projects like, you know, people who do voiceover who aren't, who don't have a full band inside of a right. recording studio. You know, one of the things um, you have to understand when you see pictures like that of like a, a legit studio, a lot of people, and especially when you're tracking drums and you're recording, it's good to understand this because you can compare it to what we're trying to do. You know, a lot of times a studio producer, if they're recording drums in a big room space like that, they actually want the reflections. They use the reflections to shape the sound that they're getting. Sometimes reflections will make something sound bigger, but what, with voiceover, we want the opposite. Uh, and that's one of the main, I uh, wish I had the, the words. It's one of the main points that I drive home all the time is to make an emotional connection with your listener. That's huge. So the, the more intimate, the more, uh, actually the less reflections, the more your voice draws people in and you can make that emotional connection because that's where you build trust. That's where you, you build a relationship. And that's what is, to me, I, I believe that's the difference between a successful voiceover that makes and persuades people to do something, to act or whatever, and then not being successful is, is that emotional connection is so important. And, uh, you know, your, your good non-reflective sound is a part of that. Right. Yeah. And I've never even, you know, considered that, you know, with the different goals and the different types of projects you have going on. I never considered that you might want to have those reflections if you're recording music. So if you're looking online for information, you might be going in a totally different direction based off of the things that you're finding. Yeah, here's a problem. And I think you, you'll probably um, relate to this. The further, you, the further you dive into recording and audio and understanding processing and reflections and things to listen for, you can't go back. It's like it's a door that you, you go through and then you're done. So, you know, once you understand, like, like what I've just talked about, the reflections, Next time you listen to a live drummer in a song or whatever that you hear, you're, you're going to, I'm sorry, you're going to hear those reflections. You're going to go, okay. And then now you listen to everything differently. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's just, it's all the little subtle things that build. It's, it, that's why they just call it an, an artist, right? A, a, a recording artist is because you're putting all those pieces together, sometimes um, subconscious, sometimes really small and minute changes, but together it creates a vibe. Yeah. So uh, in terms of things to avoid, you know, we talked about, you know, some of the basics that somebody might look for when setting up their studio, maybe not having a perfectly square room and kind of being aware of reflections and the three different types of sound. In terms of things to avoid, what would you look at? Yeah, the um, the ref all the the external noise and the internal noise. You could go and shut the fan off, and you can turn your air conditioning off if you're going to record for a little while. You can wait till the people come home and their dog starts barking. Can you tell that that's one of the issues in my house? <laughs> um, you know, those things you can manage, and you can you can minimize those one at a time. But the most difficult one, I think, for most people, and the and the one that causes the most problem is this reflection. So. Uh, to answer your question, uh, you know, it's it's soft fabric material, like you've got the foam, and really those are diffusers. Um, there's a difference between soundproofing, it's kind of a loosely used term. Soundproofing could mean keeping sound out, like if you're a loud rock band and you want to practice at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock at night, and you don't want the neighbors to call the police, you'd soundproof it so the sound doesn't travel. But what we want to do, yes, you want to keep some of that out when you're recording, but really, it's uh, it's sound treatment is what a voiceover artist is looking for, which is minimizing those reflections. So if you're in front of a window, if you're in front of a, a wall with that's not treated, hard reflective surfaces, hard reflective surfaces are your, not your friend. That's what you're looking for. I, I'd say that's the biggest thing. Gotcha. Yeah, and that's a really good point to make. For me, it's a lawnmower. They usually oh, decide to mow the lawn during guy. the summer. Right, that guy. <laughs> So uh, moving into soundproofing, whenever someone's, you know, you said that the reflections and things like that within your studio are probably the biggest problem that people are facing. What are the elements of a studio that they should keep in mind? Like you had mentioned, I have my bass traps, I have mm -hmm. a trap ceiling and some foam behind me. What are, what are those basic elements that they should be aware of so they can kind of plan their sure. starting studio and how they're going to grow into it? Uh, you know, the, the biggest thing is the reflections. Is, it, you know, you, the sound is coming out of your voice, hopefully going directly to the microphone. That's a big thing. But then they're going to hit 
the first wall, which is in front of you. So that's the, um, that's the first generation of reflection. Then once it bounce, it'll bounce and it's not as strong. And then it's going to hit the back wall or the sides or whatever. So the first, the first reflections are the most important. Um, you should take a note that the microphone, since it's pointing to you, it's really picking up directly towards you. So what's in behind you is important too. So if you had two voice panels, like foam, like you have in your studio, if you only had two, I'd put one right in front of you and then right behind you, because that's going to hit the first reflections first. I think, you know, and here's the great part, you know, if you put it in a space, you push record and you, you know, you, you record and then listen back to it with the earphones or whatever and listen for the reflections. And then you can move it around. I, I pin, I'll pin stuff first so I could move it and find the best spot. And, you know, perfect is a, what do they call it an anechoic chamber. Have you ever seen some of those videos where they have it to where there's zero? Per, look I've that heard up. about it, them. Yeah. It's, it's pretty, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Um, but it's like zero reflections and it's kind of weird and people feel uncomfortable because your brain's used to hearing all that in a space, you know, but um, you don't, have, my point is you don't, to do a good voiceover and to, uh, you know, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to minimize the reflections and increase the emotional sound. So you can make a nice connection. Actually, you know, the bottom line is you just want people to understand and receive your message clearly and relate to it. That's really all you're looking to do. And how do we optimize that soundproofing? But, you know, people get stuck and, you know, they go down the hole of, okay, the mic's got to be right. I have to, I have to have the reflections perfect or the room. And, you know, it doesn't, I, I think the worst thing is if that prevents people from sending the audition, that's, right. that's the worst, right? Because I'll tell you, if you know a few little techniques and you know about reflections and you know how to, you know, mic uh, placement and you know, I, I could, I could nail a, uh, an audition with an iPhone. If you just know how to you get a pop filter for your, you know what I mean? If you do it yeah. in the right space. So don't let all the technical stuff prevent you from moving forward and reaching your goal. That's a big thing that happens. Right. So just have a little bit of understanding of how the sound's going to bounce and knowing the first ones to get in front of first to yeah. kind of, you know, get you started. So it sounds like covering the surfaces like you said, right in front of you, right behind you are most important, which is um, kind of what I had started with. And then I started learning about bass traps in the corners. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how the sound bounces around, but I remember reading that you don't want that either. So I, I set up my bass traps. And then when I was looking for more soundproofing, because I didn't know what I was doing, I was just looking for more elements. So I put a drop ceiling and I figured it won't hurt. You know, it might, it right. will probably do something. Right. 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 It, you know, to, and to listen back and to identify it. And a lot of times I suggest listening to an audio book and then a being is really important. You know, a, a versus B go back and forth, listen to yours, listen to the audio book, the professionally recorded, whatever, or a voice that you like, and then, okay, how is that different? Why is it different? And then see if you could move stuff around and, and fix it. But yes, to, to recap, it's soft fabric material, you know, like an absorbing material and then stay away from the less hard reflective surfaces in your room, the better, because, you know, those are, those are the ones that bounce the audio all over the place from, you know, your voice audio and, and get those reflections. Right. So uh, would you, you know, if somebody's sitting down and they're setting up their studio for the first time and they have a limited budget and they were asking you for, um, kind of if they wanted to plan ahead, have like an A, B, C transformations of their studio, what they want to start with and what they want to save for and work towards, what would your suggestion be on? It sounds like the easy starting is cover the front and back. And then how would you kind of suggest adding to that? Uh, with, uh, with respect to just the room? Yes. You mean, uh, yeah, the closets are great. It, it's, it's just anywhere that you could find somewhere that sounds like there's not many reflections. So it really doesn't, it doesn't matter. You could, a lot of people, um, cars are actually great because they're designed to minimize the noise because it's like a nice quiet ride. You shut the door, you want to keep the sound out. And then you, you know, fa fabric um, material, the seats as opposed to leather is going to be better. Um, so yeah, I mean, just find a space and, and uh, find a space where it has the least amount of reflections 
and start uh, recording. <laughs> okay. Give it a shot. Yeah. You know, well, with that in mind, if somebody's looking around, I had sent you that, uh, that PDF for yes. looking at the different options because, um, online, there's so many suggestions on how to DIY your own studio. And I, re- I never really knew which one was better than the other. Some of them mm. looked a little flimsy, but you know, what yeah. did I know? So here are a couple if you had to choose between moving blankets and that cheap foam bedding that you can get at Walmart. You're really trying me because it's it's hard <laughs> to make the decision. I would say the the moving blankets, I'm going to give you answers that you're that, that are not going to answer your question. I'm going to try my best. Okay. The moving moving blankets is great. It's going to be cheaper and easier to tear down. So if you have to have a movable space and the um the foam bedding is great, but you're going to need more of them and they're not they're not as they're much more expensive than I think you can get a moving blanket like that for like 20 bucks at Home Depot. Mm-hmm. So um, which one is better? It depends on how big your space is. I, I, I imagine the phone, the moving blankets are going to be better at keeping external noise out. The foam bedding, if you have enough of them, is going to be better at uh, minimizing the reflections if they're in the right space. Gotcha. I'm so sorry. That's not a simple answer. <laughs> so in a way you might, you might do both where you have the moving blankets on yeah. the side and some of the foam bedding on the inside. Right. Yes. So, I mean, they're, they're both effective. They both do different. They'll both be effective for different reasons and, and depends on how much budget you've got and how many of them you have, but yeah, you could, you could be successful with either of those yeah. choices. And I will say that with foam bedding, it's much more easier. It's much easier to mask it. You don't have to know that it's oh, yeah. foam bedding. You know, you can cover it. Right. A lot of people put them behind canvas, right. hang it, which may or may not be a good idea with the canvas material, but uh, it might be difficult to pretend that a moving blanket behind you in a session is not a moving blanket. <laughs> right. It's good. It's just, uh, aesthetics, you know, it depends on if you're, if you care or not about that. And, um, but you could be effective with even just clothes and blankets all over the place. It doesn't, they don't have to be moving blankets. You get a big fuzzy blanket that you have or whatever, or towels. I mean, anything will work if you have enough of them. Right. So this is a big one between a closet and some type of plastic tub with foam in it where you're just encapsulating your microphone. Yeah, I, um, I to me, I, I've tried kind of the tub route and I, I'm not the biggest fan for one reason is you can't see your script uh, as w- really well. So if you're doing smaller stuff and then uh, just to me, you know, the mic is depends on what's behind you. You have to consider because it's open on one side. And then if you're in a big room with echoes, it's, it's still going to pick some of that up. I prefer the closet um, just because if it, you can hear what it sounds like and then you can adjust it a little bit more. Again, they can both work but it depends on what works. Uh, I would, it's better to understand why it's working and then just pick the one you want, but they can both work. I like the closet better in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, That's how I ended up. I think I first started with that tub idea with the foam on the inside. It seemed like the easiest uh, option. It seemed like the cheapest option and I could Mm. be anywhere. And I quickly found that it almost did nothing for me just because of the sound that was around me. And then like Mm -hmm. you said, you can't see your script. And, you know, most people that I know, they read from their monitor or their monitor, computer, right. and nobody's really printing scripts these days to, to have it, you know, just so, you know, where it's kind of positioning you with your microphone properly and all of that. Yeah. Being comfortable. And then if you're stuck in your heads in the box, I mean, yeah. you have to also <laughs> put that, put that in the equation because sometimes, you know, I, I think people will relate to this. You, you get through a script and there's maybe some kind of a, uh, a, a funky um, pronunciation and you have to do it over and over or you don't like what it sounds like or something, you know, you get to like the third, fourth tr- t- try through the, the script and you start getting frustrated and you add hot to that. If you feel like, Oh my God, it's hot in here. And then, and then your head's in a box or you can't see, yeah. I mean, you make it easy for yourself because it's I, I, one of the things I just posted a video about the, this is an artist thing about, you know, what you're feeling people that, that emotion translates as well so you want to be comfortable and into what you're doing you know like you you've got a you've got you got your sanctuary in there that's important because that helps you deliver better you know right and we were just talking about lighting uh kind of on that note because 
for me, I'm sure the first year of my career sounded like sweaty closet, you know, where I, you know, I had created this strange contraption because I didn't, you know, I had like a cardboard box and then right. those mobile foam studio booths inside yes. of it. And then I had my laptop on top of the cardboard box where I was reading the script. It's great. And yeah. I hope you, I hope you have a picture of that. I hope you've got pictures. <laughs> I don't. And I knew at the time I was like, I, I won't be here forever, but I should, so I should take a photo, but I was just too ashamed because I would, you know, send clients messages like, oh yeah, let me get to my studio. And then mm-hmm. I'm like sweating inside this box. <laughs> hey, perception is, it's all about perception. You know, yes. if it sounds, if it sounds good, who cares? It doesn't matter. And, and absolutely. I say, yes, my studio and I'm going to have to book some time, even though you're booking time in yeah. your closet. Yeah, <laughs> a- absolutely. Because you in. <laughs> exactly. It's all theater of the mind. And as long as it sounds good, it doesn't really matter what it looks like. And you'll get there, you know, as you become more and more successful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So between fiberglass boarding, uh, Owens, it's like, I don't know. Corning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Owens Corning versus uh mounts that you can kind of hang on your wall. So I remember I was looking at those, um, those wooden, I don't know what they're called. You probably know the name of them where it's like a lot of, uh, like little wooden squares mm-hmm. at different heights behind you. Between yeah. The two of those, are those even comparable? Um, I, you know, I, I think it comes down to aesthetics again, the fiberglass board with the foam, like you have on top of that, um, actually, uh, minimizes the most okay. frequency ranges. And that's an acoustic, just an acoustic thing. I think the fiberglass board uh, is going to be um, better. The diffusers, the wall mounts uh, the, of the different uh, levels, um, it's, it's more, yeah, I mean, it, it'll still work. I think for an effective voiceover, the fiberglass board is they're going to absorb from a mathematical standpoint, they're going to absorb more high and low frequencies than the, the wall mount things look cool though. The wooden, you right. know, that's like a lot of people have just that as a one piece. And I mean, it, it's definitely absorbing or actually it's diffusing as opposed to uh, being a reflective surface and it looks cool. So you could have it like as a centerpiece, but for the heavy lifting, you know, that fiberglass board with the, the dif- uh, diffusers, like the foam on top of it is actually the best. Yeah, that's great. And that is the more affordable option for most people. Yeah. So uh, this one's really popular there. I'm sure you're familiar with those microphone mm-hmm. shields. I have one. Okay. Versus, not use it, I'm not using it right now, but I, I mean, I've right. messed with them. Yeah. Yeah. Versus a small enclosure. So uh, that was one of the things that I was trying to decide between early on, because obviously you, you know, those microphone shields, are a bit pricey for, you know, a lot of people just for the, the piece, but I wasn't sure if that would be all that I would need, you know, when setting up a studio, if that was essentially the replacement for the studio or whether it would be better to put myself in an enclosed space where, uh, where my entire body is also kind of within that. Yeah, for for reflections, especially if you're singing and belting out a high note or something, the mic shield is going to help with that. Um, so I, I think for louder material, that in conjunction with a studio that's still treated will work. The mic shield, if you're just looking just to do voiceover work and you get a mic shield like that, and my my experience is they don't they don't do the job we need, which is to try to really minimize those reflections. I would I would think the small enclosure like something that you have um right. is is better for a voiceover type of thing. It, that would be my opinion. Right. And I think that uh you know because it's difficult to know what tools are useful for what purposes and what is a primary focus, like what you need to set up first to make those tools useful to you. Mm. So with those mic shields, I think, uh, especially now after COVID happened and you would see a lot of, you know, um, very professional voice actors that are on Cartoon Network and things like that, they would post photos of their studios and a lot of them use those mic shields and they also have boards up behind them. And it doesn't, I my thought was always it's it doesn't 
it looks more simple than it probably is. They probably put some extra work and they knew exactly what they were doing. And they were working with audio engineers like yourself to make sure that they were in the right spot, as opposed to someone who's looking to get into it and they see a picture of that. It, it you know, it's not quite so simple. Yeah. And, and I would say, especially maybe in a, in a voiceover actor where they have to shout and be loud at some certain times, like really loud. I mean, that's just going to be probably a, an extra help for something like that. But yeah, just alone, the mic shield probably isn't going to do the job in, in, in conjunction in a room. It's probably even going to help even more. Here, here's, here's the reason why is the more I say that the other way, the less reflections you have, the more control you have to put, you could actually add reflect. That's what reverb is. You can add reflections and make someone sound like they're in a space. And that's like dialogue and cartoon network, like you're saying, and all the voice actors and things like that. That's what they do. Sometimes they're in a different space but it gives the producer the power to do that. So to minimize them all when you're recording going in, then you have all the options on the other side of it. And that's why they, that's why we want to do that for, for more for voice acting kind of stuff. Right. And kind of like you and I had spoken about the other day, uh, where I'm at now is really fine tuning um, my know-how with different types of recordings because for example, with audiobooks, it's a much more intimate conversation and you want everything else to be dead. You just want it to be your voice nice and clear. Um, but whenever it comes to video games where I have to yell into the microphone, that's when I notice a little bit of that hollow yes. noise around me. So a mic shield would come in handy for specific circumstances for myself now, after I've kind of grown to the state that I'm in and I know exactly how and why I'm going to use it. Absolutely, because it's just an additional, it prevents those loud ones from even getting to the wall. So it'll, yeah, that would, it would actually absolutely help. That's a good idea. So the last question is, in this section is, what's more important, getting a good microphone and investing in that or starting off with a better software that you know how to use? Hmm. Um. I will say that the smartphones are pretty amazing. Um, I shoot professional video with my iPhone and people get, people still have the perception that, Oh, you're just using your iPhone, but it's 4k. And if you know, if you know how to do it right, mm -hmm. I, I would say, you know, a good microphone, I usually put them in three categories. There's the entry level, you know, hundred dollars and, and down and, and cheaper. Then there's like the four, five, six hundred dollar mid-level microphones that are really good. And then there's the, the boutique ones that are the boutique microphones that are two, three, four thousand dollars. And those are really the 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 difference between the mid and the higher ones are if you're recording a piano or something, you know, you'll really listen, you'll hear those differences. If it's a mic, I would say use your iPhone and I would say to start, you know, and, and, and work on your room and treating your room because you can get a great recording and absolutely software, all the, in my opinion, the DAW recording software, digital audio workstations that most of us, you know, it's either Adobe Audition or Audacity or people are using Reaper or Twisted Wave as one. Uh, I use Logic. They're all the same. They all do the same thing. Um, the buttons are just in a different place. So, you know, um, when you start getting into interfaces and the quality, you, you can go up from there, but they're all going to do the same thing. Learn one that you like and be comfortable with it. The difference is you start doing multiple tracks and you're recording a band, which we're not doing. So you don't need to worry about that. So uh, Adobe Audition is great. I think it's like 20 bucks, 30 bucks a month or whatever to start and uh, invest in that. And yeah, start with your, <laughs> I know that's, I, I want to remove all of the uh, hurdles. So you don't even need a mic, just use your phone. And if you know how to treat a room, you can get a great sound. I do that often for radio. I mean, yeah. I, I, have, I have people, I have voice commercials on my iPhone because it's, it's more important to get the client their voiceover so they can get on the air today before five o'clock and the close of business mm -hmm. than the quality of it. It's about the, the message. And if you can make it sound good, no one even knows the difference. So you're saying first and foremost, make sure that your room treatment is the best that you can make it. And then the mic is you know, almost secondary to that. It's not quite as important, especially if you know how to, uh, how to effectively edit it on the back end to fix maybe little problems here or there. Yeah. And that's a whole thing too. I'll, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. I could make a $50 microphone 
um, sound better with just the mic going into my computer and my room. I can make a $50 microphone sound better than someone's $3,000 microphone if they don't know what they're doing. So yes, the room, understanding acoustics and just getting a little uh, background about how it's all working and what it does. Yeah, the room is the most important thing. That's a foundation. And it's better to get a good sound in the beginning of the process and then optimize with the production and EQ and compression and fixing and RX and all the stuff that they have, D clicks and you know noise reduction. All that is going to be more effective and easier if your room and your recording is better to begin with. That's great. So if someone's sitting down and they have their room set up and uh, they think that they're ready to record, what would you suggest them to do to check the quality and make sure that it's an acceptable, you know, product to send to a client? Um, you know, listening back, that A-B thing is great because you can see how far you are and you can, uh, so, you know, record your voice in your, as best as you can treat the room and, and place your microphone and um, listen to it and then listen to it against what you would consider professional, what, you know, you you hear on uh, on a TV voiceover and commercials or what you hear and, and listen to it back to back, listen to the original file and say, okay. Mine is actually pretty close or there's something weird. It sounds echoey. And, and then you're going to have to go back to your room. You can gate, you can f- try to fix it. It can get pretty close. And I will also say that it's a, it's a path, you know, your first ones aren't going to be as good as your next one. As long yeah. as you kind of are understanding and working, then I say you're going the right direction. That is a positive. You're progressing. You're getting better. Right. Um, I'm, I'll add one more thing. So, so, um, Yes, the room and, and A being back and forth and your recording levels are really important. Okay. So moving into uh, the more editing side, let's say that someone has their studio all set up. They feel pretty comfortable with um, the treatment that they've done. Uh, when sitting down to record, what are the first things that you suggest someone to check? Yeah, I would, I would, I would definitely check your recording levels. Um, because, uh, if your recording is too loud or too, uh, if the level is too hot, your input is too hot, it's going to distort and you never want that. You've, you you got to do it over again because you are, um, it's just, it just won't sound right. And you've, you've kind of, uh, cornered yourself and you can't fix it later. So if it distorts, if it goes in the red, start over, just push stop and do it again. Uh, uh, the other side of that is if your recording level is too low, what you're doing is you're, um, you're introducing noise into the system. So you want to find the right spot. You want the noise to be, you want the noise to be minimum. And that, when I say noise, uh, I don't necessarily mean the room reflections. It's actually, there's noise comes from all of our equipment. The microphones make noise. And so, you know, when your recording level is loud enough, that noise is further down. It's not as noticeable. There's a sweet spot and there's uh, the best way to do it. I know this is a a, a, a question that a lot of people have. In my opinion, if for voiceover, you're doing one track at a time. If you could get close to negative, between negative 12 and negative six on your scale, a peak meter, you're good. That's perfect. And uh, have I told you the laugh trick? Mm-hmm. You, no, you have haven't. I, I have, it's brilliant. Um, and I, someone taught me this a long time ago. You re- you've got your hand on the knob for the recording level, and this is going to put you ahead of everybody else. You've got your, re- your hand is on the input, right? You, and, you, and you're looking and you're saying, check one, two, three, and you're setting a level. If you literally, seriously have to do a real laugh, <laughs> a real laugh, it's the laugh trick. Uh-huh. That is the loudest you'll probably ever get in your entire recording or an interview or whatever. So make sure that peak of that laugh I know it sounds silly and I've sound, it sounds stupid no, doing great. <laughs> the, the la- <laughs> you know, really do it. Think about the loudest you're going to be. And if that's in, if that's over six, you're too high. So always turn it down. That means no matter what happens, if somebody falls off their chair in your interview, or if, you know, or if you decide to take it to where you're loud, you've captured it and you won't have to start over because you went into the red that's laugh trick great. is awesome. Yeah. yeah so I will uh, use that moving forward. Laugh trick is great, especially in the field, because, you know, when I uh, sometimes I'll be recording out in the field and I've got uh, maybe a boom mic and I've got three people and they're asked, someone's asking me questions and I have to make sure there's enough battery in my recorder and the cameras, you know, all that stuff. Um, 
laugh trick, I know I'm good. So, you know, you don't have time to like, okay, wait, do it again. You know what I mean? Time is money in some of those production situations, but it absolutely will work for voiceovers this way. If that is, if that peak is at six, you're, you're in really good shape. Gotcha. So sit down, check your gain. What about, uh, what about the position of the microphone? Cause I'm trying to think of the times where I've been in studio or had an audio engineer on the other line through source connect and the audio engineer always checks the gain. And, you know, that's the first thing that we look at. And then whenever you go in studio, they are very specific about where they're going to put the microphone. Mm -hmm. I would say that, um, do you mind if we critique you right now? Yes. I, so I don't have it right here. No, that, that's okay. No, no, no. I'll tell you, I'll tell you some things. First of all, you've got a great mic uh -huh. um, and it's okay. It could be far like that because you absolutely, yeah, you, your, your, your face wants to, you have to have your face to see people. Right. And to see, I like doing it as long as the logo or where the pickup is in the microphone is pointing directly to the mouth. So okay. this way I could, this way I could read this way I could see you and I'll, that's a good thing to do. And you could move the pop filter and then you, this way you can get it closer. The, the, the source of audio that's closest to the microphone will be picked up the loudest. So the closer my, I'm not talking about proximity effect, which is a whole separate thing, but the closer that I am to the microphone, everything else is secondary, meaning those reflections as well. Gotcha. Also, also, this is something that is really important that not a lot of people do. The microphone is very, very um, sensitive. And I have mine pointing down. So if the microphone is looking, let's say that, you know, the micro, what the microphone sees and hears, it's my voice and my chest. And this is where the bass is in people's voice and now yours, which is okay. You could do, it's, it's um, like a musician. If you, if you can move the, if you're recording a guitar and you move it from this side, you're going to get a different sound from if you move it from here. It's all, it's all art. It's just whatever you want. I like to have it pointed from up down so I get a little bit more of the chesty warm kind of feel if you want less of that and more maybe nasally and or, or higher tones of your voice you could you could point it up from from the bottom up but then also it'll pick up different reflections and different sounds so it's a very strong uh, powerful technique just to move the mic around you may minimize some of those reflections and pick up different tones of your voice so it's a it's a legit thing to do to move around Right. So you don't necessarily have it directly in front of you like this, because usually what I do is I'll have it like this and then I'll just angle it a little bit away. Mm -hmm. So I'm not speaking directly into it and I don't have those strong pops, but you are even comfortable having it kind of off center from. from Absolutely. Because Over also, what you, yes. And, and also what you're doing is you what, what happens is, you know, you're you're symmetrical in your room. And then your mic is also symmetrical. And so that's maybe where some of that resonance is. The more you can offset things and diffuse and confuse the reflections, if that makes sense, the better. Yeah. So yeah, I always, I just like doing it this way from, from when I was on air uh, uh, on radio for years and years, I needed to see the buttons and stuff. So, uh, but I end up just feeling more comfortable this way, but there's no rules. It's art. It literally is. Yeah. If you, if you play it back and you don't like the sound, change it, do what you think. Right. And that's actually really helpful because, you know, I much prefer it not directly in front of my face, especially for live directed sessions where uh, I, I really value them being able to see my expression and um, yes. like having more of that human connection is so valuable when looking for that perfect tone, as opposed to if I'm like this and they have no <laughs> idea what I look like and, right. it, you know, they feel kind of strange staring at the back sure. of the microphone. Right. You, you make a stronger emotional connection with your viewers. If we see your eyes and we see your expression, I feel like I know you better. Right. I mean, that's, right. that's what it's all about. That's what the, that's what the messaging is all about. And it's easier to see what's happening and respond to it and give direction based off of that when you can see how like the intention that I'm bringing and how I'm feeling about whatever it is that I'm reading. Yeah. And then when you're at, a, at an angle, if you're in a square room like you are, those reflections have to hit more walls before the mic will pick them up again, which means they're quieter. They're not as loud because they're third, fourth and fifth generation reflections. You know what I'm saying? So if you're yeah. at an angle, the more you can be at an angle and not uh, symmetrical is better for from an audio uh, acoustic waves standpoint. Yeah. So uh, 
you know, for my setup, I have this hooked into an interface and then that connects to my computer. So from here, I can control the gain. And in other vi videos that I've posted, I just don't suggest USB, just not that I know technically why not, but I've never seen, you know, a professional recording where they're recording into a USB mic. But I know that some people who have watched the videos, they've gone ahead right. and, you know, that's what they've been considering. What would you sure. say? about that i'll yeah i'll tell you i'll tell you why I, I agree with you at this point um and here's here's generally why the quality of a recording in a microphone uh is usually based on a preamplifier, and it's 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 taking the uh low level signal that the electronics of a microphone captures this this the signal and it amplifies it and that amplification is really the one of the big parts of the tone and and the frequency response and all that stuff. That's really where you're getting you're getting the meat of your tone and sound of the voice. So uh, what happens is is a uh, and then and then your audio interface translates that amplified from the preamp signal into something digital that your computer can understand. So what happens is a USB mic has all that technology in in the microphone. It's all in the small little space. And it's all for the price of the microphone. So really what you're doing is you're separating when you buy a mic separate from an interface, then all the components are, are going to be more expensive, but they're probably better quality. Not to say that there isn't a USB microphone. I haven't heard one that sounds as good. And there may be, and they're getting better and, you know, technology. And maybe there's an expensive USB microphone that's designed specifically for that, but that's why it's all that tech and all that, um, budget of that they want to sell you a hundred dollar microphone or whatever is is in one unit and it's a small little thing so yeah if and and if you're you could start there but i would suggest um you know i agree with you yeah. separate mic interface your ability to adjust it manually as you're kind of adjusting to your setup and things like that yeah and one thing that um uh it eluded me for a long time is a preamplifier also has the ability to add material to your voice when you drive an amplifier which means you turn up the input louder not distorting to where you like peaking distorting it's a different type of distortion it's like a guitar amplifier when you drive into an amp a preamplifier like that it actually adds resonance and and um third harmonics and third and second and third order harmonics it's an audio thing but all you all you need to know is it saturates and and it thickens up your voice to be more commanding and more pleasing, and you can't do that if it's all done with a, a circuit board. And so that's one of the things that makes your voice sound so good is it is a separate preamplifier, and they don't have to be totally expensive. But that's part of you know you, you see some of the big voiceover guys do, uh, uh, voiceover people do that it's um, in a big studio with a big preamp and a high end you know that's. That's the, that's the boutique stuff, but that's what it is. And it's right. good to be aware of what that is. Right. So um, whenever I first reached out to you through YouTube, um, I found your videos very helpful. And I reached out to you with a quick question about the RMS. And you had sent me a link to your website where you have a couple different things. You do some e-learning. Uh, you had the consultation, which I thought was brilliant. And if you want to kind of talk a little bit about that and how your services can fit in for different types of budgets and different types of needs. Sure. You know, what I've decided to do was I kind of went at it backwards and then it's actually working, which is a great thing. Um, I tried to, for a long time, figure out, God, what can I do online and to try to generate some income in this world of audio that I like. And I tried to make, I tried to fill a need but what I decided to do was, okay, what do I love? What is my thing? And let's just do it and see what happens if people are into it or not. And it's totally works, which is that, my, you know, you're visualizing things. So <laughs> this is me. I love processing audio. I love um, helping, you know, and I wanted to mention this to you. You know, I, I'm, I like to help because one, you have the same passion. And if it wasn't for somebody that saw that in me when I was 19, I wouldn't be ha I wouldn't be doing this, or I wouldn't have a radio career. I wouldn't have uh, the equipment that I love to mess with. You know, so, some people kind of took me under their wing. So uh, keep your eyes open for those teachers and those people that are doing the same thing. 
and I think it's important. And I like doing that because of it. It, it feels like it's you know the the, the universe. You know, you're paying it forward. Um, I have EQ courses. Uh, I have an EQ course on my website, which is everybody that takes it. I think it's eye opening and uh, for voiceover specifically. But I also have a, a general basic kind of production basics for beginners course as well. And they're all coming from um, a, a, a DJ, a radio DJ that is now understanding that media and multimedia broadcasting and social media is the new thing. And it's all about messaging. So, I mean, it, it, it if you take those, you're going to be ahead of the, you'll be ahead of the game if you are interested in those courses. And I'm getting really good feedback and I'm working as hard as I can to get new courses out. And, and, uh, but I also have free tips and, um, free, uh, techniques and things on my website. So, um, you can get that stuff. And I like to have people send me audio and I say, let me process your audio. And, uh, that's one of the things I do on YouTube is people send me audio clips uh, I tell them to send me the raw clip. I don't want anything. And it tells me a lot. It's a kind of a snapshot of your studio. And so what I am able to do is um, I could say, okay, here's what I'm hearing. Try this in your studio and we can get the sound better. Okay, now try this in your studio. Okay, now we've got the sound good. Let me process it. And then I, I show them, hey, this is what your voice could sound like. I make a few bucks by selling the presets. That's what, that's what I love to do. I love processing audio. But what ends up happening is um, it's a win-win and I'm not ashamed to say it. It's just a great thing that kind of works. I'm able to get people to send me material that I could share on the YouTube channel and that attracts people. And then if a few of them uh, end up liking the processing and I'm able to sell the, the preset, um, it's cool because that's what I love doing and that's what I want to do. And it helps support the whole effort, you know, so that's, that's kind of what I do. Right. Yeah. So I was really impressed by, uh, your consultation package, which I think is very concise and to the point and exactly what a lot of uh, people in voiceover need and are looking for. And if I remember correctly, it was, you're going to give them um, some insight and advice on what they can do to help them set up their studio and they can do this remote with you. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of move through the process of making, you know, kind of like this uh, whole interview has been where it's like, your starting point and then what's next and then what's next to get them up and rolling and recording. Right. Yeah. And here's the thing is everybody's room is different. Everybody's voice is different and uh, everybody's mic is different or in respect to those other two. Right. So, you know, that's why presets don't work the best. They work, they'll get you to a point, but you know um, if you just put the broadcast preset on the EQ, it, it really, unless you understand the intricacies, it doesn't make sense. So everybody has a different need and their sound is different. So to customize, it really can get you to that point. You know, that's one of the things uh, I like doing, but I think that's really the service is, you know, you should get it to where you sit down, you push record and it's, oh, I love, it's inspiring. I love the sound of this. My voice sounds good. Let's, okay, give me something to read. You know, that's where I want you to be, to be create. I want to take, and when the, the fans are knocking on the door, you know, the, the manager goes, but oh, they're not available right now or no pictures, you know, that's to protect the artist, to keep everybody away, whether it's people or phone calls or noises in your system, keep that away so you could create. So in the future, uh, to kind of give people an idea of, you know, yeah, you can help set up a studio and you can help uh, with presets and get things customized and get the ball rolling. But um, like you had said before, there's so many different things that you do. Like I am more than happy to get some insight on how you set up your lighting and things like that for whenever I do live directed sessions and they can see me clearly and where I can position all of that because I know that you're interested in that as well. But also uh, the demand on voice actors is kind of going up a little bit with remote sessions yes and um the industry is opening up a lot more to smaller and mid-sized businesses who aren't going to hire an entire production company or even an agency sometimes or a marketing crew so now they're expecting voice actors to mix their voice with music or sometimes whenever it's dubbing to mix their voice into a video file that already has 
you know, noises and sounds and how to balance that appropriately mm -hmm. or um, how to, you know, just little things on how to approach a project where if you're quiet for the majority of it and you have to get really loud to have that know-how of, okay, I need to turn the gain down at this point, or if there's another, you know, option or how I'm going to handle all of those things. So uh, in short, I definitely appreciate you sitting down and giving me your time today. And I will definitely be reaching out in the future and you'll be my you know, go-to person whenever I have questions. And I'm uh, glad that you're open to kind of creating a custom experience for exactly what, you know, my needs are and other voice actors as well. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm happy to do it. And it's been a pleasure, you know, knowing you and, and meeting you and going through the process here. And thanks for having me and, and sharing who I am with, you know, your audience. Uh, but I think what, I, you know, my goal is to try to get all the, like I'm noticing common issues, you know, a lot of the voiceover people, it's like, basics of the sound room, like the stuff we talked about, about your room. And what I'm going to try to do and what I am working on is getting like a, a small kind of essentials mini course. And it's very affordable, you know, maybe, I, you know, I don't know what I'm going to make it, but um, something that's really affordable, easy to do, and it's quick to read. It's like, okay, oh, I can, it can meet with you and say, all right, read this. And then they can buy this $10 course or whatever it is. And then, okay, now we're at there. You know what I mean? This way I could kind of syndicate because I only have so many hours in the day and I hope to be that busy. But uh, at this point, you know, send me an email. I'll write back. You should see the comments on my YouTube. If I talk about EQ and compression with my wife one more time, she rolls her <laughs> eyes. It, it, it's just, that's just the way it is. But I love talking about the stuff. If, if you look on my YouTube channel, if people ask me a question and I'll write you back because I'm interested. I, I like it. At this point, I'm not, uh, I'm not overwhelmed. So it's, it's, uh, I'm happy to talk to anybody about it. And, you know, the way things are going, you're at, you're, you're totally right. Um, everybody's doing things remotely. Uh, the more you know about processing um, and making yourself sound and look good, I think the better it is for you. This is for anybody who's marketing themselves as a voiceover artist or an entrepreneur, really. You're your own business. You're your own platform. You're your own accountant. It's, that's just the way things are going, which is great because it gives the artist the control of everything. But I will say this, and I'm totally guilty of it too. Um, feed your passion, invest in yourself. And when somebody says, I'm thinking about buying this microphone, I'm like, do it. <laughs> you know, yeah. if, if you, if you love this and it's something and I said, you know, this is the right thing for you. Yes. You'll, do you use it? Are you going to use it every day? Is it going to drive you to make more? I say, go for it. I love that idea. And also, you know, it's scary, but if, uh, if you have things that you need to get done and you need an audio engineer and because you want to, Hey, I could read three more scripts a day. If, if this was all taken care of, hire somebody or buy the software that fixes that or do, you know, invest in yourself. And it's scary to do, but if it saves you time and it'll allow you to do what you really want to do, which is create and do voiceovers or take the dialect classes and learn the art, follow your passion and, hire somebody else to do the other stuff. I, I, I end up doing that and it always works out. It's a risk and it's scary, but I think um, it's just something people need to hear. And, and it's, uh, I've, I've experienced it and it's paid off for me because I'm doing just what I love to do. All right. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. I hope it helped you out. Again, I will leave the links to those coupon codes for the courses where you guys get 15% off two of his courses. In the description below, the coupon code is NM15 up through September of this year, 2021. I will see you guys next time. Bye.